keep speaking about why the world needs an existential turn. And that's really me going back to my field of origin, which is that of philosophy and, of course, since then, psychology and psychotherapy. But since the Brexit vote, I've been very caught up in all of that. But um, I finished writing a book on that and then that was it. So this is where I work uh, in London. These are my 18 books. And the one that I was speaking about is Rising from Existential Crisis in which I speak mainly about the impact of um, Brexit on EU citizens in the UK and also um, about the impact of COVID and other crises. So in view of all these crises, more and more politicians have started using the term existential, you know, existential crisis. So my argument is that we need to take that seriously. And because we are in existential crisis, we need a much more philosophical approach and we need to start to look at things across the board um, and get a new understanding of human existence and what we are doing wrong and correct that before it is too late. So we need to become much more creative, much more dynamic and much more reflective and engage with, you know, the finding of this new purpose and a search for truth and finding moral courage, all these very unfashionable things. And this is about the search for rising from our huge existential problems, pandemics, political threats, climate crisis, global pollution, loss of diversity, eco-diversity, wars. How are we going to survive and thrive on this planet over the next 50 years to a century, I think we need to get on a bit of a height there to have an overview rather than to do this constant short termism and solve problem after problem and never getting out of the difficulties and really making things worse all the time. So obviously our freedom gets very constricted by all these things that are happening. Um, I spend, well, we set up a clinic to support EU citizens for five years after the Brexit vote, because many of them were despairing and the book describes all that in great detail. But since the Ukraine war, well, the, the Russian war in Ukraine, we have set up a service to support Ukrainians in the UK. And what is blatantly obvious is that they're having exactly the same experience as the EU citizens, which is this desperate feeling that politics are messing with your life and there is nothing you can do about it. And that makes you feel impotent and pretty despairing. So how can we go beyond that? Well, when we are in an existential crisis, we need to face up to what that means. It's not just one thing going wrong. It is that everything is going wrong at the same time. An existential crisis is a crisis that threatens our whole existence. It is a sudden catastrophe that affects everything. And what that means is that all of our connections to the world that we usually rely on are destroyed and meanings are crushed and therefore people become confused. And what we need to do when that happens is to make new connections, but not just random connections. We need to understand what is destroyed and what would make sense to connect to. So people need to have a new sense of direction before they can make connections. And they need to take new actions. So it's very much about actions rather than just understanding to survive and to feel of value in the world again. 
So it's about a total transformation. And my contention is that this total transformation is something that we're going to need pretty much across the whole planet rather than just for a few people. So we need a new vision for all of us. And we need to do this by getting an overview of what has been going on and where we are heading and then rebuild a sense of safety for people. People have lost the sense that they can trust in things. They can't trust in gods anymore. They can't trust in politicians anymore. They can't even trust in nature anymore. They feel confused and lost and this messes with their identity also. So this new perspective starts by reminding ourselves what human beings are actually about. And it also is very much about focusing on the human capacity for adaptability. Now, this is the key point to be resilient, to overcome obstacles, to survive difficulties, crises and trauma. What you actually need to do is to be adaptable and to change, to transform yourself and to make the most of the circumstances you are in. And that is done at all four levels of existence. So the four levels of existence that we usually take into account are that of the physical dimension, that of the social dimension, of the personal or um, intimate private dimension, and that of spiritual dimension. So what do we need at all these four levels? Well, take them one by one. So in the physical sphere, it's all about how we can restore the balance and the harmony in nature, which has been completely disrupted and upset, and which is something that we just look at piecemeal rather than looking at it in a holistic way, understanding how we need to tackle that in a global way, in a planetary way. And this, of course, requires all sorts of skills which we need to train people for. It is underpinned by many different sciences that have to come together and work in an interdisciplinary way. And it is about acting on the world, doing things, changing things. And it starts by changing the way we deal with our environment. So people need to have a broader vision of this. They have to have a sense that they're part of a cosmos, a universe, that the planet is their concern, not somebody else's concern that it is important to attune to the natural world. We know, for instance, that people who are depressed, if we help them tune into the natural world, they get better much more quickly often than with pills. So it's also about giving people hope that we can rescue the natural world and bring the environment back to a level where it functions properly instead of having problem after problem, that countries can be made safe, that their houses can be safe, and that they can engage with the physical world themselves in an active and meaningful way by earning their own keep, i.e. being in employment, and have good health care. So if you can provide all of that, then people will be in a position to take lots of change into account and to adapt to many things. Socially, you need to pay attention to the way in which people relate to each other. It can't just be a top-down thing where politicians decide things for people. It's got to be taking into account how people live with each other. And if you don't work at that level, then people will imitate what they see 
uh, in the media and especially in politics. So a community that works well is basically a community that uses the African principle of Ubuntu, which is that of being generous to each other, of supporting each other, of working together, of having a sense of affiliation and affection for each other, and very importantly, making sure that every individual is capable of making a contribution to the world around them, is being validated for that and being acknowledged for it. Well, you can, you can hear what I'm saying is far removed from how many of our institutions work and how many organizations work so we need to really work hard at changing institutions. And that's not just about rooting out structural racism or things like that. It is about changing people's attitudes towards each other, away from competition towards cooperation. And it is about giving them hope in the idea that when we work together, we can work together to find things that are more truthful rather than being lied to or becoming cynical about how the world is organized. Now, these are not ideals. They are, these are practical realities. When you can provide this for people, they will heal of all sorts of things. If you don't, they'll become increasingly despairing. So what happens at the personal level? It's all about enabling people to find their inner integrity. That's basically what is required for a person to have a sense of inner peace, which is what they need if they're going to not be insomniac, if they're going to be able to sleep at night. They've got to be able to lie in bed and think about what they've done in the world, what other people have done to them, what the future looks like, what they can do about that, and how they can process all that inside of them and feel that they're a decent person, an honorable person, an honest person, a person with integrity, who has a role to play in the positive transformations in the world, rather than a person who wants to hide away from the negative stuff that is constantly going on in the world. Now, all of this should be done through our educational systems, but it also needs other things. It needs us not to favor science and math and profits and the economy, but also the supportive systems, creativity, teaching people how to have emotional clarity, intellectual clarity, social clarity, how to communicate. It's about teaching people a whole lot of skills that we have, but that are not being passed around. And it's also about giving people access to the kind of leisure that makes them feel they are regenerating and puts them back in touch with things that make them feel well and that make them feel optimistic and have confidence in themselves and in the world. And then finally, you need to also attend to the spiritual dimension. So often, completely neglected. I like to think of that as the philosophical dimension. For some people, it is about their religion, but for many people, it is something quite different. It is basically about what our values are and what we think about transcendence, what is beyond humanity. How do we... Um, what are we accountable to? Are we just accountable to ourselves or to our families? Are we accountable to our community? Are we accountable to our employers, to our city, to our country, to our continent, to, to, to what, to a higher power? It's very important for people to be able to have a dialogue and debates and discussions about this and it is completely not talked about and one of the most taboo things to bring up 
even in academic circles because it is considered to be soft. But it's actually incredibly important for people to have to know what they believe, to not have that poo pooed or to have to hide it, and to have a sense they have a freedom of creed. But it is far more important, I think, at this juncture in human history that we co create a joint framework of morality and a new commitment to justice and freedom and all kinds of things that people all around the world generally do agree with, but that are often far removed from what we observe is happening in the world. So there is an incredible cynicism that has been created in people where they just not interested in politics. They're just not interested in a whole range of debates and discussions because it doesn't concern them. Because what concerned them is these much more um, emotional, much more personal, much more human things that nobody is seems to have any interest in. And is not attending to. So we need to find ways of reconnecting people, reconnecting them to the physical world that is in disorder, to each other in a trusting way, to the wider circles around them of um, cities and countries and politics and society, and also to these wider images of shared beliefs and values. That's a big task and we need lots of people to work that out together, but nobody's really doing that very much. We need to get this understanding. If we're going to solve all the conflicts that we're going to be hitting in the next few decades, faster and faster and faster. So the whole immigration problem is going to, of course, become much, much more intense with climate change and whole continents becoming under fire, literally, and countries um, having to move to different parts of the world. So we have to learn to do these things, work together and find the courage and compassion to work this out somehow. So I look forward to seeing what John and I make of that together. Um, that's it for me. Thank you very much, Emmy. That was very interesting.